thinking about love and woundedness uh, from the perspective of being, you know, me, Francesca Maxime mm -hmm. in Brooklyn, and mm -hmm. you, you know, Lama Radawin's currently located in, in, in California, right, uh, for the day. Mm -hmm. um, and yet all of the stuff that has come before us and all of the yeah. ways in which that it's not just a local wounding mm -hmm. um, or a local mm -hmm. loving, but it's an intergenerational or transgenerational or a, yep. a panoramic kind of, of ways in which mm -hmm. um, we're wounded and healed, or mm -hmm. I don't really love that word healing, but mm -hmm. we're, you know, mm -hmm. sort of uh, repaired, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> recovered yeah. in, in yeah. relationship also. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and, and I feel like that, that, that practice is a process of moving through grief or something like yeah. mourning or something. Yeah, I don't know. Absolutely. Yeah. Tell me your mm -hmm. insights on that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, I just, um, you know, for me, it's about being okay. And for me, when I am okay, I am in balance right and so balance doesn't necessarily mean that i am comfortable um that i'm like loving the world or i'm enjoying anything it means that i am in a position where i'm able to hold the space for myself you know and i'm not being distracted by you know the sensations of pain or uneasiness um those sensations those experiences are there but i'm able to be with them you know yeah. and if i'm not able to be with those sensations if i you know have to enter into an experience of um, disembodiment or disassociation i can know that you know and that's still in a way being okay you know and that all, of course all comes from this sense of mindfulness sense of awareness where we're just trying to show up to what we're experiencing we don't have to like what we're showing up to you know yes. but we have to we just have to try or have at least the aspiration to show up to it you know and so you know i've been working with trauma for years and studying trauma uh, formally and you know i have been really exploring specifically transhistorical trauma you know mm -hmm. and you know as people who are descended from slaves you know the point of our transhistorical trauma was really the middle passage you know, and how that middle, middle passage became an energetic kind of disruption um, that's been actually passed from generation to generation, which has been um, uh, deepened by systematic oppression, by racism, um, by, uh, by misogyny, um, by homophobia, by anti-queerness you know queerness and so forth and so on. Um, and so much of my, my work, and this is the work that um, I'm hoping to promote more and more as I uh, deepen my teaching, is to, to help people to understand that like, this is our work to disrupt the transference of trauma into the next generation. Mm, you know? and this is the Yeah, and this is the work not only that we're doing for the next generation, it's the work that we're doing on behalf of our ancestors who are, themselves yes. are still in trauma. Yes, yes. As, mm -hmm. No, no, just finish. <laughs> no. Well, I was, I was, really quickly, I was going to say, you know, that, you know, it is the ethical responsibility of the living, particularly um, as descendants of slaves, to do the unfinished work um, of returning back to a sense of equilibrium, to a sense of okayness. You know, because we have the opportunity, we have the privilege in this body, in this life, um, to do the work of liberation um, from trauma. Here, here, hell yes, <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, and yes, and yes, and you know, I love the way that it's really like. You know, my mom always used to say to me, "She's the Italian side." Um, mm -hmm. uh, always said you know, noblesse oblige, too much is given, too much is expected, or, you know, you're, you yeah. basically like have to have to do stuff mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when you're given opportunity. And I also hear you saying it in a way that like, we have to stand accountable, like this reckoning has to take place. Yeah. This is something yeah. that can't just be like spiritually bypassed, yeah. pre-forgiven, like I like to say, <laughs> hopped over, you know, mm -hmm. jumped ahead on. And that while it isn't necessarily easy, simple, you know, like, 
in your messy conversations with your radical dharma book it's very you know it's mm -hmm. it is whatever it is it's going to look yeah. you know different every day and in every different way but that it is our responsibility because we're here now because that's mm -hmm. the eternal now but that the healing works both ways yeah or it works it's like a trifecta of healing yeah. now past mm -hmm. and future <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and, and the fact that we need to do that in a way that makes sense for us, right? Mm -hmm. But that at the end of the day, you can't escape it. Like it's, you're going to hit a certain amount of pay dirt where there's that reckoning. Yep. Mm -hmm. And how holding it maybe together while mm -hmm. doing individual work can be yes. a real way to help oneself collectively you know, do that so you don't feel so Absolutely. alone. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. That feels important. I, I think it's, it's detrimental right now. I think we're living in a time and in a place where the level of trauma as well as PTSD is palpable. Uh, we feel it in our minds and our bodies, but we feel it in the earth and it is something that's also here, held in the air that we're breathing. It is in the water. You know, it's in all the elements. This is a world that is um, saturated by disequilibrium. Right. You know, imbalance of disassociation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Don't get me started on dissociation, because because <laughs> my my whole thing about that is the collective dissociation is what happens when you do the colonization, when you come in yeah. and you create fissure yeah. where there was none, when you yeah, basically exactly. frack a people, when you yeah. essentially you know put stuff where it's not supposed to be or doesn't naturally mm -hmm. evolve from, you're necessarily mm -hmm. going to create separation. And then I know you know Dharma teacher Tara Brock talks a lot about uh -huh. separation as the whole. Like, that's the thing. Like, we feel separate, but we're not. Well, yes, but if we're not interrogating the constructs around that, enslavement, the Middle Passage, genocide, indigenous genocide, you know, that at a certain level, we can't just walk around and assume that, well, those things didn't happen or right. we get over them and they don't live in us as part of what our dissociative experiences are, which could be eating right. the bag of Oreos. Not that there's yeah. anything against Oreos, but right. if it's a dissociative experience around eating them, okay, well then you can even, as you said, be aware of that yeah, and still do it, but you could also yeah. opt to maybe not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I guess I just feel like interrogating the whiteness piece, the white racial supremacy, white body supremacy piece around that. Mm -hmm also is important for folks who are lighter white skin privileged. I mean, you're saying yeah. it's the healing of people of color, but I also feel like, what is it like to be the colonizer and have to hold that or the inheritor yeah. of that, even if yeah. not yeah. you, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, you know, it's, it's, everyone's in trauma, regardless of, of race, you know, um, the colonized and the colonizer, right? You know, but, colonizer is perpetually in a state of disassociation, which allows the colonizer to do the work of colonizing. You know, um, yeah. we just had, you know, Indigenous Peoples Day, which was formerly Columbus Day, you know. Um, and then you read, <laughs> you read the accounts of Christopher Columbus, and you go, how could this person possibly get a holiday? You know, what kind of of people would honor a man who oversaw and, and perpetuated such violence, you know, on a community of people, you know? That's the height of disassociation when I can do it, anything that I want to you and it doesn't bother me and I can just continue doing it, you know? But then I think about, about Paulo Freire, where, you know, he talks about in the pedagogy of the oppressed, where it's, it's the oppressed who will liberate the oppressor, you know, and yeah. what I understand that to mean in the trauma perspective is that it will be the work of the oppressed or the colonized to return back to their bodies in order to reflect what embodiment looks like back to the colonizer, I love that. to the oppressor. Mm. You know, like we're, 
we're struggling, we're engaged in this project to continually uh, cut through, move through the impacts of colonization of oppression. And it, it's that struggle that actually is helping us to experience more and more freedom along this path, a freedom that our colonizers or white people or anyone in a position that is creating violence um, is not experiencing. You know, but to be reminded of as an oppressor, as a colonizer, to be to be reminded of the body is also to be reminded of, I mean, that deep pain, mm. you know, and that and that brings me to like this, you know, this personal, I don't know, struggle, which is do do men, do white people, do anyone in a colonizer or oppressor position have the capacity to turn back? into not only their trauma and PTSD, but also the inherited transhistorical trauma and PTSD from their ancestors. You know, how do you just start doing that work? You know, and when I reflect on that, I really, my heart softens, right? Because I understand the immense difficulty of doing that, you know? Um, like I'm fortunate to be born in this body and, and you know, in the skin, because this is, suffering isn't new to me. You know, suffering has been with me from, since the day that I was born. I was taught to be in a relationship to suffering. Um, it wasn't a liberatory relationship, but I was taught to be aware, to know it, you know. And when I came into Dharma and meditation, I was taught the tools to actually transform that relationship even mm. more to something that felt more open, spacious, free, kinder, you know, um, and I could find the joy within that kind of new relationship making within Dharma. Um, but so much of our work is really trying to convince white people, men, to actually uh, do the work of returning back to that pain. And also beyond that, helping them to understand that they will, they can, they can survive that turning back. Yeah. You know, and this is why Dharma is so imperative right now, because I think it offers us the tools to help us turn back into what we habitually run away from. Um, and it helps us understand that we're not going to lose, we, we don't have to lose ourselves in that turning back, that we have the energy to consume this pain, this chaos. Mm. instead of it always perpetually consuming us right and in that consumption if we're just going to go with the food analogy because when i consume mm -hmm. a bagel it goes in my mouth and it goes out my butt because that's what happens when i consume something so it doesn't yeah. stay in me yeah but it gets processed yeah. differently and that energy yeah. is used in a different way exactly exactly so that idea of consuming around you know you're not being eaten up you're eating in you know it's sort of like a tonglen practice in a way mm -hmm. right you're breathing in the suffering you're breathing out the compassion mm -hmm. I mean, i believe you're the tibetan buddhist but i believe that's yeah. a basic tonglen <laughs> practice mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that that you know that you're that you're that you're processing it but that you're being held somehow in the middle and for me and you know when i work with um if I'm doing like more psychotherapy with folks, um, you know, I'll call them clients or patients, or if I'm teaching, you know, mindfulness or something, mm -hmm. I'll say students or, or just people, right? Just people, because mm -hmm. um, I've yet to figure out how to teach a cat. They usually teach me things. Um, <laughs> that um, that that the 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 part that gets stuck is folks have a difficulty in my experience believing mm -hmm. that there's a floor that there's a them that there's a unis of you yeah. that there's an essence of you that's unbroken that's not that that's okayness underneath all of the tornado of of, of suffering and, and chaos mm -hmm. and that if you start to touch into it and you feel into shame or you feel into I'm a terrible person or I'm not supposed to be here, or, I'm bad. If you are the inheritor of the colonization, colonizer, you know, part of the colonization, mm -hmm. that if there's no floor there, if you don't feel like there's any unis of you there, um, mm -hmm. that 
that turning away from, um, it just does, it just happens because it just feels like you're just going to get swallowed up. Yeah. Um, and so how do you practice mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. folks mm -hmm. that touching mm -hmm. into that essential nature mm -hmm. that is there, that is almost like a leap of faith? Yeah. 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 And that's really hard to do. It's really hard just to tell people, okay, just turn back into the pain. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, so I, I never try to do that. You know, um, always, as I say all the time, I try to offer a spoonful of sugar. Um, yes, you are. <laughs> you're, you are a spoonful and then some of sugar yourself. So if they're yeah. sitting with you and you're holding space with them, yeah. I think it's probably easier. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and like in my training with my teachers, none of my teachers gave me a spoonful of sugar. You know, um, they gave me a spoonful of vinegar to make it worse, you know, because, you know, because they're like, no, but some sorry is actually worse. So you need to like actually just wake up and just deal with it. But that was the teaching that I needed. Like, I'm just like straightforward. So mm -hmm. often, you know, I have to realize, I have to step back and realize, oh, you know, people need more, more support. So this is, you know, what I do really on the ground is I, you know, I always say that like, you need to call in what you need to do the work, you know, of moving into this energy. And so I have, you know, this is all, you know, so much coming out of the work that I've done around trauma, um, both personally and, you know, working with my trauma, but also in my study and writing of trauma, um, where I offer a, a structure to help people move into energy. So this, these structures are based upon you know, loving kindness practice or meta practices. I have a practice called the seven homecomings, which is really imperative. Um, and it's just the practice where we call in these beings that love us. You know, we acknowledge the earth under us. Um, we acknowledge um, the kinds of teachings that deeply inspire us. And it creates a, a container for us that's filled with this intense energy of care you know, and so I ask people to move into what seems difficult, but doing so in a way where they always feel supported by this energy of care, yeah. you know, from these beings around them. And so, in, and always reminding people that they can, they, they're, they're titrating, right? They're touching in and moving out, touching in and moving out, right? You know, and that's the point, you know, well, that, well the heart of, of what we're trying to do is create the space around the difficult stuff and to also create choices and how we are going to relate to that you know and for me that's like the basic principles of working with trauma space and choice mm, mm, mm. you know um, yeah and if you're calling in you know we call that in my trainings like resources and you know oh, yeah. you can mm -hmm. you know and whatever it is i mean i when i work with folks it's like it could be your cat, it's your dog, Willow, yeah. it's your grandma yep. who's been deceased, it's your deity, exactly. it's your stuffed animal, mm -hmm. it's the Incredible Hulk or Wonder Woman or whatever, you know, one of my clients, it was Zorro, you know, uh -huh. so I'm like, great. Sometimes it's Beyonce. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, and and then call in the Bayhive because then you have like, you know, then you have like a massive mm -hmm. amount of, of followers and actually in processing a trauma memory one of my clients actually brought in like her cheerleading team like her oh, you know what I mean? wow. like like yeah. literally having cheerleaders like and like literally having people like reflect back like mm -hmm. no that's not okay and yes mm -hmm. i need you know and whatever it is that that these are things that in our brains in our imaginal world and you know this as a visualization practitioner mm -hmm. that yeah. our brains are funny <laughs> they they, yeah. they like it when we give them nice food even if you know, it's calorie free, meaning mm -hmm. that it's a made up story that we're making up in the present moment that isn't what actually happened back at the point of trauma, but the one that it wants to hear. Mm -hmm. They yeah, like that. Absolutely. Yep. Um, so this piece about homecoming practices, I really appreciate. And, and, and I guess that's where I kind of fall short with this idea of self-compassion versus self, um, mm, sort of just self-celebration in a way mm -hmm. um because mm -hmm. i always feel like we want to be compassionate to the conditioning and the behavior that we've yeah. adopted in order to be adaptive because mm -hmm. behaviorally that can show up in the world that causes harm to ourselves or others in ways that we don't have full agency to your point and choice and consciousness around 
but that if there's really a foundational level, like the eunice of you that there's nothing wrong with, I'm like, well, you don't really have, I mean, it's kind of redundant to be compassionate to that because that's almost right. the compassion. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Not that yeah, the, mm-hmm. just, it's more like verb, verbiage, but anyway, that's just mm-hmm. like a thing for me. Any thoughts mm-hmm. on that or no? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I think that like we have to, well, you, so you point out something really important, which is that, so I can like, I can sit around in teachings and whatever, and just like throw out a bunch of language, you know, but for me, what has been most important is for me to reclaim language and to say you know what this is what this means for me you know so like every time people come they sit with me I always say you know what take this and use it in, uh, in whatever way you need to and you can frame this in different language whatever you know fi- figure out what makes sense for you you know because all I'm doing is just offering something that has made sense for me mm. from my practice mm. you know again that's like the sense of choice you have a choice right you know and it's so funny you know people are so conditioned to do what you say (laughs) you know (laughs) like to the t (laughs) to the t you know and then as a teacher then i've had to be like oh like i need to always remind people that they have agency to do something different yeah to shape it the way it works for them yeah because i i just naturally always had that like, I, I'm naturally very hard-headed and opinionated, you know, and critical, you know, and judgmental and all of that, whatever. You know, I own it. Um, and so I, I brought that into my practice. You know, I brought that into working with teachers where I was like, oh, like, this is what the teacher said, but this is what I actually need to do. Mm. You know, um, that's important. Um, and I think a good teacher or even a good therapist will be, will have the, the wisdom to understand that the student or the patient is actually integrating in a way that can be sustainable for them over time. Yeah, right? Because isn't it that sustainability that's so critical, right? I mean, because yeah. we're here for as long as we're here, but we would like yeah. to not just have it be a one-shot wonder where we feel good one day and yeah. forget how to return to balance um yeah tomorrow yeah <laughs> exactly and we want to yeah, I think, remember I think, that yeah yeah i think that's what we're always trying at least what i'm always trying to do is i want people to be well you know and i don't want people to be dependent on me you know so i am like deeply deeply like a practice-based person. I believe in my practice and my teaching ethic, it's like, here's all these things. Like here are all, you know, so many things. I want you to take this and practice with it, you know, because it is your practice and it is your inherent wisdom that's actually your teacher, you know? And if you can connect to that, then you, I mean, that will be a path that will lead you even into the process of, of death and dying yeah. and beyond if you can cultivate that sense of like agency and self-reliance but self-reliance on this inherent intrinsic wisdom and clarity that's inherent in every being you know i love that and hence yeah. the former name of this podcast wise girl or wise yes. guy and you know like i said <laughs> earlier you know like your own inner wisdom your own inner child whatever yeah. you want to call it that that own inner knowing right mm-hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Joseph Goldstein talks about it's the knowing, you know, the the knowing quality and, and it's not knowing like a thing, right? Mm Because we know things aren't fixed. We're just, it's it's the knowing, the capacity, the process of the, Mm -hmm. the one that's always, um, accessing, receiving, processing, moving through, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, Beautiful. Um, okay, so maybe switching gears a little bit to talk a little bit about uh, some of your new projects, like uh, your book. I know you're yeah. working on something that, mm-hmm. again, folks who can't maybe see you at a retreat as you are now yeah. in, in LA yeah. um, can read. You've already written Radical Dharma with your um, yeah. fellow co authors, but um, what else is next? Yeah, yeah. So my next book um, coming out in June is called Love and Rage. Um, Love and, and- Rage. Love and Rage, yeah. Um, 
and that book came out of a lot of the intense energy we were feeling post election. Um, and like I, like many people, you know, felt as if I had to scramble to create these solutions to, you know, to survive, you know. And um, I was sitting with a lot of people, working with a lot of people. We were, I had um, started a series of workshops called, um, well, around um, activism and mindfulness, you know, because everyone all of a sudden was interested in activism. <laughs> yeah. Know? Like everyone. Why. Yeah. <laughs> I know, you know. Um, so we were doing that. I just felt like that wasn't enough, you know. And I, I remember having to, to kind of slow down, you know. I remember that, like, you know, I remember on the day of the elections, um, I called my mother. And, of course, like, I'm, you know, I'm, like, freaking out, right? I'm just, like, this is the end of the world. And she was, like, basically, she was, like, oh, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> you yeah, know? wow. She was, like, her life was continuing. And I was, like, and it was so grounding for me, you know, to say, oh, like, this is samsara this is like what is supposed to happen like i have what i need you know like my teacher would say whatever happens happens whatever comes comes i don't need anything at all you know and so like in the middle of 2017 you know i just kind of came to this place where i was like no my activism yeah it's, it's yeah I have to be out on the streets as much as possible but I, my activism is also holding space for myself and for others around us because everyone was like freaking out flipping out yeah. you know um, and still are you know um, and so the book emerged from that and emerged from this incredible amount of woundedness that people were experiencing but couldn't name and this incredible amount of anger that people felt suffoc suffocated by, you know? And I couple that with what I felt to be the heart of how to hold space, which is um, deeply embodying love, you know? And so, so the book is, is, really, is really examining, you know, not just anger, like anger and rage, but it's actually looking at the woundedness beneath our anger and all the storylines and narratives. Mm. Um, a, around that wilderness. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, then I committed myself to doing, writing that book, which was like difficult to do, you know, because I just, I felt like I was creating somewhat of a new language um, to talk about this. It's a very, it's, you know, it's so interesting when you're writing books, you write a book and you've spent so much time with it. This was the same case with Radical Dharma, where you spend, so actually Radical Dharma is very quick. We're like, we turn that around in like less than a year. But, you know, when you spend so much time with the text, you know, you forget that you have to give that text away <laughs> to the world, right. you know, but you get bored with it. Like I get bored with it. I'm like, oh, this is so boring, you know, but when you, when that book is published, right you know then it takes on a different life and it's like ascending up you know you, when you, you get on a roller coaster and that first like climb up the first hill you know and then when you get to the top of the hill and you like you know slam down into like the first drop that's how releasing a book feels it's like the book just gets scattered out into the world and you're like holding on yeah <laughs> you know and saying what is happening you know you're just like screaming you know <laughs> and then you get used to it you know um so yeah so that's you know that's the book i think it's going to be a really different take on things i think i have a really interesting perspective um it's a really vulnerable book mm. for me i really get into you know, the, you know, my experience with depression, um, I get into sexuality, um, gender, I get into sex, you know, um, of course, there's the anger piece as well, you know, but I talk about trauma, particularly trans historical trauma, you know, and it's a book that I wrote to first and foremost, black people, black folks, my community, but also to activists, to the queer community, to the trans and gender non-conforming community. Um, the book is for anyone that struggles. You know, um, I see it as like a love song 
mm. you know, for people. And it's a very, it's going to be a very different Dharma book as well. Um, I want the book in many ways like Radical Dharma to be accessible across belief systems, across communities, across religions and spiritualities um, as well. Beautiful. Yeah. And I think that that's you. I mean, I think that that's just sort of the way you do your teaching and sharing and living is, is that, um, I don't know that anyone who is light skin or white skin privileged, identified, whatever you want to call it, who's saying, Oh, I can't sit with Lama Rod, you know, or, Mm, you know, someone who's like a, a, you know, trans, uh, you know, Asian, you know, mm-hmm. woman is just mm-hmm. like, why well, I, I can sit with Dom Rod. Like, it's not, you know, mm-hmm. or some people are just like, well, I don't want to sit with that person. I don't feel like, exactly. you know, you, you do yeah. hold space, I think, um, for create, create an inviting, invitational, welcoming mm-hmm. space for all kinds of uh, folks and identities, which I think is one of your, one of your gifts, one of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and now, you know, it's so, it's so bizarre. It's like when I finished the first draft in May, I was like, there's no way I'm going to write a book ever again, <laughs> you know? Um, and now it's, um, now I'm beginning to write my next book, oh. um, you know? And so, and this book is really on something that I thought I would, wouldn't be able to get to for years and years, but I'm going to actually get into body and the sex, body, into the body and sexual expression. Mm. um and you know everything in pornography um plant medicine um i mean this is um i i just want to get into these taboo things within our communities and for me this is a continuing project with trans historical trauma because part of our trauma is this belief that we don't have agency over our bodies you know, that comes from our slave ancestors who, you know, their, their agency was taken away from them. That's what slavery was. I right. have, you know, you take away one's agency over their bodies, you know, and that's a trauma that's been transferred. It's so, it's so true. And I'm just thinking, I mean, talk about self-disclosure, TMI, yeah. podcast listeners, here it comes. So I'm like <laughs> on a date last weekend yeah. and, yeah. you know, like, you know, it was first date and, you know, we're sort of kind of getting hot and heavy and I'm just like, yeah, no and not sleeping with you, you know, not because I didn't want to, not because I didn't like have a hormonal thing that was like saying, Mm -hmm. yeah, go for it. It's fine. Not because I haven't gotten rid of some of my, uh, you know, old school kind of like, oh, don't be slutty or don't be whatever, like, you know, like whatever. But honestly, Mm -hmm. it was two things. It was one, like when I felt like I stopped becoming a person to this person and I sort of felt like I started just becoming like, you know, it's like the craving, right? Like their craving was greater than my ability to have space to move into, to then step in and choose agency there Mm -hmm. around like, I want to be with you. And I, you know, in in the sense of like, Mm -hmm. you want to take me and that's fine. I mean, it's nice to be desired and I would like to Mm -hmm. be with you, but there's no space in between. I can't come into you. I can't come to you. Mm -hmm. I can't have my agency if everything about your construct is winning and dominance and, you know, and, and so, and so reclaiming this space to me has often been about, unfortunately saying no, right. Which is often the experience historically of, I'll just say it like women, right. Like me too, like whatever, but could be anyone. Um, Whereas, you know, making time for joy and making time for space, I want to create it to be able to step in and say yes right like I want to be able to say like I know I have agency and I want to be able to move into this with you know does this make any sense or am I absolutely and so like and so like for me on that that means it has to have more of a systemic change where the system embodied in this one particular person last weekend Mm -hmm. of Mm -hmm. patriarchy which I think this particular body was holding is yeah. is mitigated is lessened because yeah. then it would more intuitively know hey i need to create a little bit more space here so this person yeah. can move in and then we both get more of what we want yeah yeah well and then like so so then that person a person who is trapped in that kind of patriarchal mindset they themselves have no agency over their bodies you know um there's no compassion for themselves or their bodies either 
you know, um, mm-hmm. and of course, you know, it goes back to colonizer, you know, and colonized. It's like my, I, I have a right to colonize. This is what patriarchy is. Like I, as a male identified person, I have a right to colonize the world. I have the right, the right to get what I want from anybody that I come in contact with. And that's, I've been taught that that's okay. And so when there's resistance, I think, oh, you know, you're disrupting this natural order. You know, yes, so you and have I was to like, be subdued. Right. So annoying. And and that's the the, the the heart of all the violence, you know? That's like this this tendency for me to believe that when you resist or when you say no, then you're like disrupting the natural order or something. When in fact this natural order is actually wrong to begin with. Yeah. It's not natural, actually. <laughs> you know? And then I feel validated to move through those boundaries because I believe there is a moral, ethical, you know, uh, mandate for me to do this because that's what I've been told. Mm-hmm. You know, um, if the world is supposed to be mine and the world resists, then I have a right to subdue the world. Right. You know? And f- and fortunately, in my case, in this case, in this example, it wasn't... Um it was subtly violent in the ways of just, you know, not having any, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, uh, although I've been subjected to the other things that were, you know, which is not, Mm -hmm. which is also not cool. Um, Mm -hmm. and traumatic and, you know, the recovery continues. And so, but, but around that piece, uh, you know, one of my teachers, Terry real calls it privileged, Mm -hmm. privileged obliviousness. Um, Mm -hmm. sort of uh, this entitlement piece or this grandiosity piece that's kind of built in or baked into stuff. And then you're going to hire people maybe if they're, they probably won't be the ones listening to this podcast, but they might be like, oh, you're man haters or you're, you know, white man hater, you know, then then there's that argument. I'm like, no, it's it's a system that lives in people who get born into this structure that then when it's not decalcified, manifest in ways that can be not so great exactly exactly you know and there's this whole phenomenon happening which i don't get you know as a a person of color where white men feel as if they're being oppressed yeah that's the new one yeah (laughs) that's the new one and you know in this movie the joker I was just having this conversation with a friend of mine out here who's in, in the film industry. Uh, you know, we're just talking about like that movie, how, you know, it's working right now, you know, in the industry, you know, and it's like, ah, this like narrative that perpetuates this idea that like white men, and I'll also generalize and say men in general are under attack, you know, um, and that's a very, very dangerous narrative because it distracts us from the systematic realness of, patriarchal abuse, particularly by cisgender men and male-identified folks, you know? Let me ask you this. I've been told by one of my teachers that I respect, and I believe it to be true in some ways, and in much the same way you say it is the responsibility of people of color to reckon with their trauma around the Middle Passage and um, transgenerational, you know, that really that the fourth wave of feminism will be about um, being more mm. man loving and being more about loving firmness and being around mm. the idea of having mm. this idea where we're willing to be teaching. We're not just resentful. Yeah. We're not yeah. just resentful on the back end. We, we, we've come into our own. We say our wants and needs up front. We're okay with limits and boundaries. And we're also willing to do some of the emotional labor of teaching you how to do it, which is kind of like what you were saying is if a person of color is embodied and knows how to have joy and does dance and does show up and is recovering from the trauma that's been, that in this example that you had given, lighter white skin privileged inheritors of the colonization Mm -hmm. will then see that and witness that and say, oh, I don't. I don't know how to do this quite yet, but someone's doing it. And can I have some of that or can, you know, and is that, is that, mm-hmm. how does that set with you that it's. Yeah. I think. Or is it a both and? I think it's both and, but like, I don't know. I, as you were you know, sharing that, you know, the thing that came to mind was, and this is really complex and this is kind of what I'm trying to do with an undoing patriarchy work, but like trying to, I think that 
if I can articulate this, that particularly from the tradition of Tantric Buddhism or Tibetan Buddhism, you know, we understand that like real change doesn't happen until it happens on the energetic level, you know, and on the ener energetic level, there is an expression of energy that in one way is gendered, but it has nothing to do with gender at the same time, you know? Um, and I think that for the future, I think that for, I think that the movement has to go inward to affect the energy, but it also has, you know, for all of us, the work has to be recognizing that we embody all forms of energy, you know, masculine and feminine energy, and to love those energies that we habitually push away. Mm. You know, so like for me, my, you know, my practice for years has been coming into contact with this feminine energy, you know, and making a home in that energy. And I think the feminine energy begins to balance out even this masculine energy. And there's an equilibrium that I'm coming into, you know. And it doesn't mean that, like, I'm entering into the space of being gender non-conforming or non-binary. It's actually not, it's, it's much more subtle than that, you know? And I think that's where the work is for us in this next wave. Mm. Um, and I think when we do that natural acceptance and deep energetic work, then we just kind of love everyone. You know, we begin to love men and their violence. You know, we don't love the violence, but we be begin to love the person who is lost in their ignorance and who is actually perpetrating that violence out of ignorance. And how you do you know? live relationally with that person? Mm -hmm. Well, you live, well, I mean, the only way you can live relationally is first and foremost through boundaries, right? Like, I can love you, but you don't get to do what you want, <laughs> right? You know, but like those boundaries, I think, have to be erected in order to act as a mirror that reflects people's violence back to them. You know, it's like, no, you, I, you know, I can't live with you, you know, and it, you have to actually acknowledge this boundary. And as you acknowledge this boundary, then you're going to, you know, you're going to have to see the ways in which you make it hard for me to be around you. These boundaries mm -hmm. that just didn't come from nowhere. Right, they came out of my lived experience of being around you, you know? Um, so stuff like that, like that kind of like understanding how to want people to be happy, to be free from suffering, but also knowing that I too want to be happy and free from suffering, right? You know, yeah. that it's, it has to be both. Right. Um, for us, you know? And I think loving those who are violent doesn't mean I love myself less. No. You know, um, I think that's the subtlety that I think that which many of us are trying to still work with, you know, as well. Um, sometimes love means that I have to go away. You know, I have to have distance because I need to minimize the ways in which you're able to hurt me and to hurt others. You know, and that's out of love for you. It is out of love for you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And again, that's back to my whole sort of thing that makes me kind of sad, although it's really where we're at, which is that it's about limits and boundaries and no, yeah. not that we don't need them, but that it's about without constriction, but restriction. Right. It's about right. containment, Restriction. not, you know, do you know what I mean? It's this sort of the difference between containment and rigidity. That there's yes. a, yes. <laughs> you're like, hell yes. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and I think that that's what's so subtle. And the sadness for me is that my natural tendency is as a human, and I think generally speaking for a lot of humans, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. to want to be generously compassionate and um especially for folks who aren't cis hetero male identified that are, you know, deeply, deeply um, ingrained with boy code from the get go mm -hmm. around um, 
not having a heart, just like women are yeah. deeply ingrained about not having a voice, yeah. to quote Carol Gilligan, yeah. um, that, that, that there's really, uh, there's a sadness that I have <laughs> around like, in order for me to, to have a place in your world, I need to withhold. I need yeah. to be contained. It makes you feel safer when I'm not generous. Um, and this is, yeah. it's a, it's a, it's not an across the board always dynamic, but it's an often right. dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, and also maybe for me, it's, it's this wisdom that helps me to understand that like, not everyone in my life is able or has the capacity or, or has even earned the right to hold my fullness. Can you repeat that, please? <laughs> okay, so it just, came, it just came to me. Um, <laughs> not everyone so is capable or so has not the everyone, right. Go ahead, you tell right. me. Okay, so not everyone um, is capable, has the right or has earned the right to hold my fullness you know and that's about understanding how to avoid suffering how to avoid getting hurt you know as you know as Brene Brown talks about it's like there's only like one or two people that you can be completely 100% vulnerable with you know and they have had to earn that do a lot of work you know and I think from there like in my work I go a little further and say you know there are there's a stratification there are levels of people that have earned different levels of vulnerability and so that has to be the case because if I love myself I'm also interested in remaining free from violence you know and I do that by understanding that like I can only reveal myself to the people who have the maturity to hold me you know, if that's not the case and I get hurt. Yeah. You know? So I know that. Yeah. And I know, I know who those people are, you know, and often these days I can feel very, you know, very early on in meeting someone if they're able to hold me, you know, so I could feel, I can feel how people adapt. I can feel people's reflexivity, you know, um, just in like how they move the world you know i can feel that really early on in my relationship to people you know so that's a way in which people are earning our vulnerability by showing that like they can hold things by being adaptable and you know and flexible yeah mm -hmm. yeah i love that and and i appreciate that and i know we're starting to kind of wind down and 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 um mm -hmm. and close out the last point you mentioned vulnerability um I feel like intimacy and vulnerability are really, really uh -huh. um, close together. But I also mm -hmm. feel like in my experience of late, people are starting to equate, or maybe they have for a long time, and I'm just noticing it now, uh, when they say, I want you to be vulnerable, or it's okay to be vulnerable, or I only feel safe when you are vulnerable, or when you're more vulnerable, yeah. it makes me feel safer. Wow. But they don't really mean vulnerability. What I mm. think they mean mm -hmm. is shame. Uh, uh huh self-effacement or some kind uh -huh. of like i'm not going to you know that they're that they're sort of um an unchecked like it's not just about vulnerability because vulnerability yeah. can also be in your glory it yeah. doesn't have to be in your depths of sadness and darkness mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's often equated with that and i'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that yeah yeah so when so so when you say shame, so when people are saying vulnerability, you know, you're saying that people are instead talking about shame. I think often they are. And I don't mm. think that that's because when I talk about vulnerability, yeah. I talk about showing up in a way that I can be fully intimate with myself and with others right. without pretense right. and without, you yeah. know, and I don't think that those folks can be intimate. Uh -oh. Uh -huh. And so I think what they're really asking for is, you know, something that resembles vulnerability, but is more yeah. rooted in shame because that's what makes yeah. them feel more comfortable. Uh, yeah. 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 So, yeah. I, I totally resonate with that because I think in my experience, it's, um, 
vulnerability is a really powerful word. So when people say vulnerability, you know, it's like, well, what do you mean? Like how far, you know, we don't talk about like the, the levels of vulnerability, you know, and vulnerability is something that we have to earn from one another. It's not something that I can just say, be vulnerable. You know, it's a, it's a process, you know, and sometimes if we're, if we're with people in relationships where, you know, we may have been doing the work to be really trustworthy and really open and we may be vulnerable ourselves, we have to kind of understand too that like people are, are, that shame is actually the one thing that keeps us from being vulnerable because we, we, we've all been hurt and that hurt is actually informing a lived experience of being with someone. You know, and we have to be patient with that. Yeah, yeah. And I think sometimes, too, if you've worked through some of the work, like you talk about, Mm -hmm. um, and you are in post-traumatic stress recovery and not just post-traumatic stress, um, Mm -hmm. that sometimes the confidence or the inner wisdom or the connection with self around stuff can be, while honest confidence or honest Mm -hmm. self-esteem can be interpreted as Mm -hmm. more of arrogance or something or right like exactly and i don't get that either i mean like that's sad to me too you know Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. and so i guess i would just yeah that those are just a couple things i've been reflecting on lately also yeah how can you be in your power and take your seat in the midst of it all noble and dignified as um, Jack says, uh, Cornfield, my teacher, you know, and I'm sure many before him uh, and, and have that be okay. Yeah. The world, because like that self-confidence actually reminds people of their lack of self-confidence. Yeah. And we all like many of us, not all of us, but many of us have a really ambiguous, confused relationship with our own self-power. You know, again, I think that comes from being hurt by power, you know, and like, I think our work is to be empowered with ourselves and thus empower with others around us. Yeah. You know, because power isn't going to go away. It's not going to disappear ever, you know, so how can we balance it out in our relationships with one another where I'm not trying to like nominate you, nor am I trying to be, you know, submit to you or be subdued by you. I'm just trying to hold my space with you. And I want to know what that looks like. And I want to be in, an, I don't know, a dialogue with like what that looks like moment to moment to be in power with ourselves and to be in power with simultaneously with other people around us. Beautiful. On that note, to be in power with ourselves and to be in power mm-hmm. simultaneously with those around us in a relational and embodied, grounded and connected way here on the Rerooted podcast. Lama Rod Owens, I am so thrilled that you're here. And I would like to give a special shout out to the fly in LA that has been buzzing around. I know. (laughs) All podcast that um, listeners will not be able to notice was here, but viewers will. And how you skillfully through all of your mindful, there he is, or she, um, that that, that this is what we do when we sit in long retreats and uh, just sort of learn to coexist with that, which is otherwise somewhat irritating uh, and annoying. And, um, and I think that that was kind of a good meta metaphor um, yep. for, for what we've been talking about anyway. Mm-hmm. So the book is out in June. Yep. Uh, Love and Anger. Love and Rage. Love and Rage. Love yeah. and Rage out in June. And then the next one to come after that. Lamarado yeah. and thank you so much for joining us here on Rerooted, the Be Here Now Network. I'm Francesca Maxime. We'll talk again, I'm sure. Take good care. Thank you.